Well, hey there, I'm Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com, and this is episode number 81 of Goulet Q&A. This is June 5th of 2015. I had to look at the date. I recorded this on the 4th, so, you know, I had to get my dates straight, so I never know what day of the week it is anyway, but um, welcome. If you've never seen this broadcast before, it's a live weekly, not live, but it's a weekly broadcast that I do, um, and uh, answer all kinds of pen ink questions and so on. So, um, what have I been up to for the last week or so? Let's see here. This past Wednesday, we had Goulet Blue Day here at Goulet Pens, and the wall, the color of the wall behind me, blue, that's our color, uh, and so everybody wore blue, so it was pretty fun. Um, and then, let's see here, we have, uh, oh, tonight, actually, while you're watching this, it'll be the previous night, but as I'm recording this tonight, my son is graduating from preschool, so he'll be in a, you know, whole graduation get up, and apparently they're going to be singing a song with some choreography. It should be pretty darn entertaining, so that should be pretty fun. Um, let's see here, got some new pens, um, the new Omos Arte Italiana Vision. Um, I got those uh, actually in on Wednesday, so I wasn't expecting them to come quite so early. I thought it would be a little bit further out, like mid-June, but that was kind of a happy surprise. So those are kind of cool. Um, I'll be talking about more those more a little soon. I plan to shoot a video on them. Um, and then the Pilot's uh, Bamboo Pens, they're wood vanishing points. Um, so those are pretty cool, like real wood, like actual real wood. So there's a black and there's a cherry color. Both of them look really good. So check out the pictures of those. Um, should be pretty cool pen. It's a little more expensive though, for sure, because it's real wood, but um, really interesting pen. Um, let's see here, Pilot uh, G2s. Uh, we're gonna be stocking the, you know, not the full line, but a whole lot of the uh, Pilot G2 roller balls. Um, as well as refills as well, including all kinds of cool like metallic colors and stuff like that. It's pretty, pretty interesting, pretty fun. Um, digging those. We got the Pilot Metropolitan uh, roller balls now, which use G2 refills. So you'll have some more options for refills in your Metropolitan as well as your G2. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then over the next several weeks, um, we're going to be launching some new lines of, uh, new to us, lines of cross pens. So we're going to have the Botanica, the Classic Century, Century 2, uh, and the Townsend. Uh, and the click gel as well. So um, lots of interesting stuff going on there. It's all, uh, the Botanica is actually a new pen from Cross. That pen is pretty sweet. Um, the rest of them have already been available from Cross for a while. Um, it's just new to us. So we're a new, relatively new Cross retailer now. So um, if you like Cross, there you go. Um, so that's kind of what we've been up to. Um, you know, got some videos and stuff that we're working on, but uh, you know, my schedule has been a little erratic for the last week or so, so um, had a lot going on kind of personally and everything, so we haven't been pumping out quite as many videos as usual. It's totally my fault, um, so I apologize for that. But have been jumping on Periscope quite a bit more lately. Periscope is a live streaming app um, that you should definitely check out. You can join live or you can see everything um, that I've done in the last 24 hours. After 24 hours, it drops off though, so you gotta kinda keep up with it. Um, so just kinda neat little behind the scenes insights to what I do around here and, and uh, kind of some you know shop talk and things like that. So it's pretty cool. Um, digging Periscope for sure. Um, so that said, got some good questions for this week. Um, so to kick it off here with the pens and writing questions, um, Mal Gorzata R on Facebook, 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 how about that? <clears throat> I'm getting ready to purchase my first Kueco Sport fountain pen. I just watched your Kueco nib size comparison video and have a pretty good idea what size I want, but I wanted to ask if there's any difference between silver and gold plated nibs other than color. Do they give you a different writing experience? I heard that gold plated nibs have better ink flow. What's your experience? Um, so yeah, this is something kind of interesting for Kueco and a few other brands. A lot of them, they don't have an option for gold or you know rhodium trim or silver color trim, whatever you call it, stainless steel. It's all that kind of that silvery color, right? Um, so especially with um, you know uh, pens where you have an option for both, you know obviously it could it could be a little confusing. So the way that it works, okay, Kueco uses stainless steel nibs, right? Stainless steel is inherently silver colored. Um, so the gold nibs actually have gold plating on top of the stainless steel. So it's actually really interesting to me that you have um, heard that the gold plated nibs have better ink flow. Because if anything, I, I would suspect it would be the other way around. Because the stainless steel nibs are just stainless steel. They have no additional plating or coating on them which normally if it's not plated and like done like really well, it could it change the ink flow or like the, the plating is, it's electro plating, it's really thin coating of gold that's put on these stainless steel nibs. But if anything, the plating would be um, an additional thing on top of the normal nib. So it would somehow have the possibility of restricting flow. It, but honestly, 
it, I don't hear that happening much. Now it's the opposite with actual gold nibs. So actual gold, like 18, 14 karat gold, is yellow. So it is that gold color. And if you have a rhodium plated gold nib, something like a um, Pilot Metal Falcon, right, has the same nib as the Pilot Falcon, the resin one, except that it's rhodium plated. So it's actually plated on top of the gold to make it look silver. So it's the opposite. So in a stainless steel nib, you have silver and you have to plate it in gold to make it look gold. When you're using actual gold, it's solid gold and then it's plated to look silver. So usually if there's any kind of difference, which there rarely is, but if there's any kind of difference in ink flow or performance at all, um, it would be in whichever one has the plating added to it. Um, but that said, it's pretty rare that that ever happens. It's to basically so rare that it's not even really a, a factor. So I think that if you're reading that the gold nibs have better ink flow, I think that's purely a coincidence or maybe it has something to do with one type of pen versus another or something like that. I think there's something else going on there, but the plating in and of itself usually doesn't make a difference, especially with the Quaco. I really haven't heard of that happening a lot. Okay. Uh, next question, Brendel L on Facebook. Looking for a double broad nib. What fountain pens have this nib, have a double broad? Oh gosh, not much, not much at all really. In fact, I looked at gulliapens.com, we don't carry anything in a double broad, nothing, not a thing. Um, you can definitely get some very wet broad nibs, um, you know, but uh, there's really no double broads that we have available to us. Uh, and even by special order, the companies that offer that by special order, I'm thinking Pelican and um, Omos are kind of the only two that like come to mind that even do double broads as a special order. They're cutting those out. Like now it used to be that Pelican, we could get a special order. They would stock them in you know the US. Uh, Chart Pack is a distributor for Pelican in the US. They used to stock them. Now I think they're not even stocking them anymore. So now it's a special order all the way back to Pelican Germany if they're even gonna continue offer it at all. I need to get some clarity on that. We get asked about it so rarely, I haven't just like really followed up to kind of define that because we don't, we don't stock you know, the Suvron series anyway. So that pen is already a special order for us and then it's like a special order on a special order and it's just, I don't go chasing down that road unless I have a specific reason to uh, for the most part. So that's been changing. I think double broads are just going on the way out. Even broad nibs in general don't sell that great. There's certain brands like Conklin that are just like pfft, ditching broads all together um, because they just they really don't sell that well. You know, we stock Goulet nibs here, the broads, they just don't sell like, they like 5% of the fine nibs. You know, it's like really, 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 really low. Um, so double broads is even a fraction of that. It's probably like 5% of the people that would buy broad nibs would buy a double broad. And I think that has to do in terms of like paper quality. I mean, they're super smooth, but in terms of paper quality and stuff, a double broad is so wet that it's just almost unusable for most people. Um, some people really, really love them, but they are much harder to come by than they used to be. So over the last like six years, since I've been in business doing this stuff, um, I've seen a trend of double broads and broads kind of starting to disappear. And you can say what you will about that. I think it just has to do with the fact of what people are buying and what people want. So I, I can't really like analyze it too much deeper than that other than it's just a matter of economics. You know, pen companies are gonna make whatever people are buying. And with a nib like a double broad, if no one's buying it or very few people are buying it, it doesn't make, it doesn't make practical sense to distribute those worldwide especially if there's just not a demand for them. So it's kind of sad to see, um, you know, fewer options of nibs than there used to be in some way, in some models and stuff like that, but it's kind of is what it is. So you might still be able to find some around, but I don't have, I don't have any of them and I'm really sorry about that. <clears throat> All right, uh, Schaefer King on Twitter asks, how do you tell what size a nib is if it doesn't have any markings? Okay, so there's kind of like two ways that I can interpret this question. Size meaning like fine, medium, broad. Um, it's actually somewhat rare to come across uh, pens like that that don't have any designation. It definitely does happen. Platinum has a couple of pens like that. Um, you know, there's some that just don't have any designation whatsoever. That gets a little, uh, you know, annoying. Um, usually that's pretty easy. So you can, you can usually just kind of write with it, compare it to, if you have another fountain pen, compare it to another fountain pen you have and then be able to tell that way. Um, that's, that's probably the best way. Once you've handled quite a few pens, you can almost tell pretty much just by looking at the tip about what size it is. Um, 
if you're, but I, the other way that I can interpret this question is probably a much more common one that I feel um, we get asked about a lot, which is basically um, how do you tell like the overall size of the nib? Like here's a nib pulled out of a pen. Um, and uh, how do you tell whether it's a number six or a number five or whatever, right? Um, we get asked about that a lot because there is no designation of that on the nib itself. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here so you're gonna get to see how uh, unshaven I actually am. Woo, okay. Oh, weird throat thing. Hey, hello. I have a monitor over here so I can see if I'm in focus or not. Um, so when you have a nib like this, if it will focus on my nib, ta-da, there it is. A little nib there. Um, if you have a nib like this, the way to tell the actual size designation, this is a number six size nib. And the way that you can tell it's a number six size is if you look, there's a curvature to the nib here. And if you measure in between the point here and the point over here, the distance there is six millimeters. So I've got my ruler here. Da, da, da. All right, I'm gonna try to do this like, it's all mirrored in reverse and stuff like that, but it's gonna be kind of weird, okay. So if you look there, if I measure in between, boom, six millimeters. Oops, hold it still. Six millimeters right there. Now, another pen, such as the Kaweco Sport that I just showed earlier. So if I yank the nib out of this thing, it's a smaller nib, and I'll show you just how. Okay, so I pull the nib and feed out. And if you look at the overall size of the nib, you can tell that it's a lot smaller than the number six that I just had. Whoa, what a difference, right? Huge difference, okay? So you can have different lengths of nib and stuff like that, but um, the Kaweco, if I use the ruler, sorry, the focus is gonna go nuts. Okay, so here's the ruler. So if I hold that up, you can see, ooh, yeah, there we go, five millimeters, okay? So number five nib, five millimeters. Number six nib, six millimeters, right there, so that's, that's how it works, okay? That's the big magic secret of how you measure nib sizes. Now, the, the confusing and frustrating thing is that, um, you know, many, 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 almost all pen manufacturers do not advertise what size designation their nibs actually are. And I kind of get it because most pen companies aren't really wanting you to go swapping their nibs with other brands' nibs because they can't warranty them, they have no idea what the flow is gonna be like and stuff like that. And sometimes you can have a number six that has a little bit different bend or curvature to it so it won't flow right and all that kind of stuff. So pen companies match up their feeds and the engineering design with their feeds to match the nibs that they're going to be using on it. So, and they tweak the nibs and stuff like that accordingly so that it's gonna work properly in that pen. When you go swapping and stuff like that, sometimes just an even swap, even if it's the same like number six nib or whatever, um, the flow is a little bit different and it maybe isn't kind of what you expect because it's not really designed necessarily to fit that pen. These aren't made to be truly universal most of the time. So it requires a little bit of hack, a little bit of tweaking and stuff like that. But in general, that at least answers your question of how do you tell what size of the whole nib that you're dealing with. Cool, we got it? All right, let's move on. Uh, Bijan A on Facebook asked, long question, I'm gonna paraphrase, okay? So basically, Bijan here has, I hope I say your name right, has a pilot vanishing point, which I have right here. So I got a green one, just uh, you know, fancy, fancy green metallic one, neat, right? Um, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit again uh, here so you can see what's going on. So I have a green uh, pilot vanishing point, and if I unscrew it, you can see that the nib unit pulls right out of the pen, and the converter that's used in here is the Pilot Con 50, the piston uh, converter, like so. Um, and it just goes right in there. So um, what Bijan is asking about here is there is a converter called the Con LAS, I guess that's what it's called in Japan. That is the converter that is used on the Pilot Metropolitan, which is not sold separately apart from the Metropolitan. It comes in the Metropolitan as well as in the um, Pilot Parallel. It's called like the cleaning converter in the Pilot Parallel. So if you take this converter, can you use it in this nib unit instead of the Con 50? Bijan here is having trouble. So it just will not fit. Um, so I have a converter here, I have a nib unit here, I'm gonna stick it in and mine fits, like it fits great. Um, sometimes you have to really push on there, especially if you're using like a Con 20 converter, um, which looks a little bit different. In fact, I may have one of those right here. 
hang on. I've got a bin of like, you know, cartridges and converters here. Um, yes, I have a Con 20. Hello. I have a Con 20 right here. So this is a Con 20, right? So the Con 20 and the Con LAS look almost the same. They're the same size. They have the same bladder in them. The Con 20 just has a little more of a metal housing on it. So it's a little sturdier, a little better for a long-term converter option. Um, so when you go to put that on a pen, when you go to push it, it's going to give you some pretty steady resistance on here. So um, you have to really jam it on, but there, I just got it. So I had to kind of get it over the hump, and then once I do that, it'll go on there just fine. So I'll put it back on here, screw the pen back together, voila. Okay, so that's with a Con 20. Now the Con LAS, I gotta put that on there. That one actually goes on a little easier because this converter's already broken in a little bit. I've been using it on my Metropolitan for a while. So to put that on there, same kind of deal, works A-OK. -okay. Now this converter is a little bit shorter, so the nib will come out and it will uh, still work just fine. It just won't come out quite as far as a Con 20 or a Con 50. Because if you look at the overall length of the converter, it's, uh, it's just not as long as the other two. So if it's very fine uh, difference there. Can you see the difference? Yes, you can. There you go. So it's just a little bit different. It still is workable. And you can see here, it's literally just like a little bit of metal there on the end. So while it will work, I would say probably don't look to use the converter out of the Metropolitan or the Parallel um, as a long-term solution for your vanishing point. But if you get yourself in a bind and you find that you really need one and you have one of those converters laying around, um, you should be able to work it in there. It just uh, takes a little bit of uh, fortitude being able to get it on to the actual pen. Sound good? All right, got a couple of ink questions for this week. Uh, Carrie Stars on Twitter, hello Carrie. Um, let's see here, after a day or so in my pen, PR Shell Pink, that's Private Reserve Shell Pink, goes from um, raw shellfish pink to cooked shellfish red, not because of water. Any idea why? <laughs> I like your analogy there. It's just very fitting that it happens to be Shell Pink. Um, so I would, the first thing I would do is like look at the bottle. How does the overall bottle look? Um, and the reason I kind of say that is because um, certain inks, like I think Shell Pink is one of them, certain inks are, are pretty heavily saturated with dye. And um, based on the combination of dyes that are used, you can sometimes get what's called chemical sedimentation. Okay, chemical sedimentation essentially is when you have a kind of a chemical reaction that happens with the dyes and it actually like crystallizes and drops to the bottom of the bottle. This happens with certain inks. I think Shell Pink might be one of them. I've seen it happen with um, Vampire Red, Dakota Red, uh, some Pride Reserve ones. I've seen it happen with um, Diamond Pumpkin, uh, Noodler's Dragon's Napalm, Georgia Peach, uh, Atlantic Salmon, I think, Hellfire. Certain colors, especially in this like pink and red range, actually all those inks I just named, except for the pumpkin, all of those were in the reddish kind of range. So there might be something about like the pink or the red range that just makes it more susceptible to this type of reaction. I'm not sure. I'm not a chemist. I don't really know. But, um, you know, inks that are really saturated, dye would like, PR, PR definitely falls into that group, um, can have this kind of chemical sedimentation. It doesn't necessarily hurt anything, um, but if you're, if you're inking it up and you're sucking up any of that stuff from the bottom, um, which can happen, um, especially if you're like shaking up the ink. That's, that's one argument against shaking up ink is when you have these particular ones where there's a lot of kind of fallout and sedimentation that kind of can happen. Um, you know, that you shake it up, it kind of float around in the pen and then it can kind of give you a different look. So basically what's happening is you're getting some of that chemical sedimentation in the ink up into your pen and then it's kind of like falling out as you're writing with it. So what's happening when you fresh ink it up, you write with it, it's a lighter color, cool. As it kind of sits there for a while, the, st the darker stuff that kind of falls out can then work its way through your pen. It doesn't necessarily hurt your pen because it'll still flow through for the most part. If it doesn't, then you just clean it out and you're good to go. Um, but what happens is it can change the color and make it a little bit darker. So I think that's what's going on. So my suggestion to you would be, you know, clean out your pen very thoroughly, what you have there, inspect your bottle of ink, see what's going on there. Um, and then maybe next time you fill it, 
don't shake the ink and try just don't dip your pen like all the way down into the bottle but try and keep it closer to the top and fill it slowly so that you're only sucking up stuff kind of from the top of the bottle and then see if that makes any difference to you if it doesn't then maybe you got something else going on it could be you got a bum bottle maybe something was mixed right or something like that and if you got it from us please let us know you know maybe i'll take a look at our shell pink and just kind of see what it looks like uh, just in case but um another another explanation completely not related to chemical sedimentation at all is it could be that you're having some evaporation that's happening you know depending on what pen you're using it in i don't know you didn't say um, but depending on what pen you're using it in it's starting to get hotter maybe you got air conditioning going it's drier environment i don't know uh, i don't know exactly remember where you are so um, your environment is if it's a very arid environment and you have evaporation that's happening even it's i mean a day or so is pretty quick but it might be enough depending on the pen like if it's in a noodler's like flex pen or something you know really wide open feed on that pen it can dry out relatively quick maybe not dry out completely but enough to where it would actually change the color of an ink like that that might be kind of prone to be doing that anyway um, so I would say try that out, maybe try it in a different pen, see if you still get the same reaction. Uh, maybe try a different ink and see if it's, see if you're getting the same kind of thing, like a completely different ink, but in a similar shade or, or lighter, you know, a kind of a lighter shade that you would see a, a difference if it were to evaporate, um, maybe that would be it. Um, so those are kind of the recommendations that I have. A little bit of detec detective work involved on your part still, but those might give you some possible avenues to explore. Sound good, Kerry? All right. <clears throat> Uh, Derek Jones, 14 on Twitter, asks, "What is the inks? Uh, what inks most resemble Virginia Tech colors?" Uh, Virginia Tech is my alma mater, and the school colors are Chicago maroon and burnt orange. Okay, um, and. Uh, Little point in fact here, when I was hand making pens, um, I actually officially licensed Virginia Tech pens. So I would, in, I would make wood pens out of Amboina Burl. Any of you woodworkers out there know what that is. It's one of the most beautiful woods in the world, my opinion. Um, but I would, I would make pens out of that, rollerball pens. I didn't do anything with fountain pens at the time. I would ma you know, make rollerball um, Virginia Tech pens and then engrave the Virginia Tech logo and the seal and all that stuff. And then I'd have it sell it in a, in a uh, you know, a real wood box with a Virginia Tech seal on top. Um, it was awesome, but nobody wanted them. So we ended that affiliation and I stopped making pens altogether and I became a fountain pen retailer and here we are six years later. So um, that's basically the story. But anyway, so big fan of my alma mater, Virginia Tech. Don't really follow the sports so much. I know it's like heresy not to follow your college. Uh, you know, athletic teams or whatever, but I just, you know, it's not, a, not something that's important to me personally. So, um, but anyway, that I digress. So Virginia Tech colors, Chicago maroon, burnt orange. Okay, so looking at some ink colors, the ones that I kind of felt were closest um, were for a red, I would have to say probably Noodler's Tiananmen because um, it's a nice maroon, doesn't have a lot of brown to it like some other ones. I thought about like, you know, Diamine Syrah, it's got a little too much purple, Diamine Oxblood, got a little too much brown. So Tiananmen I think is a pretty solid maroon color there. Um, and then um, the other one, the burnt orange, I think Jerobon Orange Indian is probably probably the closest one. The burnt orange is interesting. It's not a bright, super bright orange, like, you know, blaze orange or diamine pumpkin or something like that, but it's also not, you know, I thought about diamine autumn oak, but it's not quite as, you know, that one's like a little too burnt, you know what I mean? It's like almost charred, kind of crispy looking. So I don't know how an ink looks crispy, but use your imagination. Uh, but I would say that uh, Jerobon orange Indian. So those combinations right there will get you pretty darn close as far as ink choices go for uh, one of the greatest universities in the world. Anyway, uh, Tony H. on Facebook said, a lot of attention goes to Noodler's Bay State Blue. You noticed that, huh? Uh, but there are two other colors in the Bay State line, Concord Grape and Cape Cod Cranberry. Can you tell us about these inks, in particular, how they differ from the blue? Well, the biggest difference is Bay State Blue is blue, Concord Grape is purple, and Cape Cod Cranberry is pink. So that's obviously a very stupid answer. It's very obvious, but that really is the biggest difference. Um, they're both very vibrant inks, both meaning the two that you asked about. Okay, there's three in the line. All three of them are very vibrant. However, Cape Cod Cranberry and Concord Grape are very bright, but they are not as standout above and beyond insane like nothing else brighter than other purples and pinks that are out there. So in general, I think Bay State Blue gets a lot of the attention because it really doesn't have any equal in terms of its vibrancy. 
with any other blue. It just really stands out. And blue is just a more popular color anyway. I think it's the best color in the world. So right there, just blue in general, not Bay State Blue specifically, but it's pretty cool. Bay State Blue is actually a little bit too purple for my, my personal taste. I do love the color that's super vibrant. It's, it's awesome, but it just really stands out. So the Cape Cod Cranberry and Concord Grape are very vibrant, but not quite as vibrant as Bay State Blue. So there's a lot of alternatives that you can use that are purple and pink that don't have quite as much hassle, I'll call it, as the Bay State line of inks. Bay State line of inks are higher pH. They do not mix with other non-Bay State inks. So you gotta clean out your pen pretty thoroughly when you're using it. If you have any you know, residual ink that's non-Bay State and you put Bay State in there, it's not gonna be great. Um, so you gotta make sure that you're really being diligent about cleaning out and switching in between those inks. So that said, it's generally not worth it for most people to go with the grape or the cranberry, um, but the base state blue is worth the hassle for a lot of folks. So that's in general kind of just my assumption, my synopsis, if you will. Um, that's just kind of what it is. It's really kind of a blend or a combination of the things. But in terms of like chemical makeup and stuff like that, the, the other two base states are, are similar to base state blue. And in fact, you can mix all three of those with each other and come up with other variations of general like kind of purpley, bluey, pinky kind of color, um, you know, but uh, that those can mix with each other. They just can't mix with anything else besides base states. Cool. All right, I got one paper question here this week. Uh, Amon Veer G on YouTube asked, Hi, Brian, I've been the sneaky person who just lurks and doesn't really post or comment. Well, thank you for coming out of your lurking lifestyle for this question today, Amon Veer. Uh, let's see here, but I do have a question. Can you please do a video on how to write on dot grid paper? I'm confused. Graph paper, say as paper, French rule, blank paper, I get. Dot grid totally eludes me, thank you. Well, that's interesting. Um, dot grid really is not any different than graph paper. Um, it's five millimeter ruling in between the dots. Essentially, if you take graph or grid paper, whatever you wanna call it, they're five millimeter squares basically that are drawn on the paper. If you take, if you take and you put a dot at the intersection of every line on a grid paper, and you remove the lines, you're then left with dot paper. So it's the same ruling and everything. So basically, as you would use graph paper, you use dot paper. It's really that simple. However, because the dots are much more subtle than the grid or the graph ruling, you can use it as more of a blank paper if you want to. I'll do that all the time. I'll, that's part of why I love like the Rhodian number 16 dot pad, or I've got a number 18 right here, you know, so. Here, I've got a 16 right here. So I literally have like several dot pads within arm's reach on my desk. So when I zoom in here and you take a look at what the dots actually are, um, it's literally just very subtle dots that are five millimeters apart. You can kind of use it however you want. You could draw, just uh, use it almost as blank because the dots are so subtle. You can use it as, as lined paper. That's kind of how I do it, um, is I, just, I have journals that are dot grid and I just write on it as if it was regular lined. Um, and you got a couple options there. You can either go single line, which is five millimeters, so that's a pretty tight ruling. So if you have something like an extra fine or whatever, that you can use that that way. Um, and then the, what's cool about that is with the different dots that are going up and down, you you can use that as kind of a tab or like a margin kind of thing. So as opposed to a line ruling where it's just you have to kind of guess where your margin is going to be, you can really tell where it is here. Um, another thing I like about the dot grid is I like to use this whenever we're doing any like rearrangement of furniture in our office or something like that. Um, it's really cool. You can draw like boxes on it and do the shape of a room and that works really well and it doesn't compete with whatever you're writing as much as graph paper does. So you know, don't ever think it too much. You can kind of use it however you want. Um, it's really not that complicated. I think say yes, yeah, the French ruling is more complicated than dot. So hopefully that clears up something for you a little bit there. All right, got a couple of personal questions. Um, Calligraphy Pete on Twitter. Hello, Calligraphy Pete. Um, you recently had uh, to MacGyver into your own office. Uh, which pen breaks down into the most MacGyver ready parts? Okay, technically, uh, what I did was I Mission impossible into my office. So uh, long story short, what ended up happening, I'm in my office here. It's not a very big office. Um, I just moved into it relatively recently. I didn't realize that there is a locking doorknob on this office. Um, and that, uh, well, I did realize that. So one day I was, 
I was changing, so I locked the door. Um, I was changing, uh, I think it was for the, um, uh, what video is it, the vacation pens uh, video that I actually have yet to release. Uh, here. You're going to see that coming up soon. For any of you Periscopers, um, we green screened that one in Periscope Live on that one, so uh, you missed that. It was pretty funny. So you'll see that coming out pretty quick. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty entertaining. Uh, but anyway, so we, um, uh, I was changing, so I locked the door, and the way that this doorknob works is I um, went to open the doorknob and it's not like the kind where it locks and it locks the inside doorknob when the outside doorknob is locked at the same time. So I, I'd forgotten kind of by the time I changed and had everything on my mind. I opened the door, no problem from the inside, not realizing that the little push-in thing was still locked and that the outside doorknob was still locked. So I left it open. I leave my door open pretty much all day long and then at the end of the day we were going home for the weekend so I pulled the door closed and realized that I had locked the doorknob. And because I've just recently moved into this office, and it's just an internal office, you know, I realized like, shoot, I don't know if I have a key for this office yet. I need to like talk with my landlord and get a key. And my landlord was out of town and so on. So uh, long story short, I was literally locked out of my office with no way to get in. I don't know how to pick locks or anything like that. So we've got a drop ceiling here. Any of you familiar with drop ceiling? It's essentially metal framing and then just, you know, two by four foot panels that you can just lift out. Um, so pretty much my only option if I wanted to get into my office was to go into the room next door, um, set up a step uh, ladder on the table <laughs> next door and then lift up the panel and jump over the wall and then drop down through my ceiling. And that's exactly what I did. Um, and uh, that was actually kind of fun. It was very interesting trying to balance myself up on this wall because you know with a drop ceiling like this, it's deceiving because you see the ceiling and the insulation and it looks like, oh yeah, there's plenty of space here that I can grab something if I start to fall, but it's, it's deceiving because it's just like little wires that are holding up this whole ceiling. So if I like lost my balance and fell and tried to grab something, I would literally like tear down the whole wall and fall and have metal and you know insulation and stuff all in my face so that would not be good <laughs> so I had to like really balance myself like up on this little four inch beam that is the wall that connects these two things and then like you know lift up the other panel and like spin myself around and turn around and kind of drop down through it was very harrowing um, Rachel was watching me with much concern but it's okay I made it got in unlocked it I don't lock this door anymore when I have to change I go elsewhere until I get a key so anyway that's the context as to what happened but uh, your question is okay so I'll kind of go with the MacGyver thing right because that I feel that was more of a Mission Impossible dropping in through the ceiling you know the original Mission Impossible I was like in high school or middle school or whatever when that came out and it was like super like awesome when he did like the whole thing he was on the floor oh, you know Tom Cruise so um, that that's kind of where that context was but anyway going with the MacGyver thing so you asked me uh, what pen breaks down into most MacGyver ready parts um, you know I would say I don't know something that comes apart you know pretty thoroughly right like I would probably go with like a Twisby 580 or maybe a VAC 700. VAC 700 would be cool because it's got some like it's got that rod in there and different parts o-rings and stuff um, or like a Noodler's Ahab there's lots of different parts you can really take that thing apart I feel like those would be some of the ones I don't really know what you could actually like use them for or whatever I remember back when I was in you know middle school and I never did this, but I had friends who did, um, would take their Bic disposable pens and convert them into spit shooters and stuff like that. I, of course, never did any of that because I was a perfect child, but I heard of that happening. And there was this other thing you could do where you would like take the Bic, you know, um, you know, the stick part and then you would have it and you'd have a rubber band and you would make it so you could flick things like that. I don't know, I saw other people do it. I know I never did it myself or anything, but you know, I saw, saw it happen. So you know, there's lots of those types of things. Like those would be a little more MacGyver ready. Fountain pens, maybe not so much unless you're just going to like, you know, you know, like stab somebody, but don't do that. Don't stab people with your pens. That literally happened though. I heard about that a couple of weeks ago. It was in like an article or something I saw somewhere, like CNN or something like that. Like somebody literally stabbed another person who was snoring on an airplane. This lady whipped out her fountain pen and stabbed him in the arm or the leg. I think it was a leg. That's what it was. But like, seriously, wow. Tense flight, tense flight. So anyway, that's kind of what I would say. One of those two. Sure, completely wacky answer, but there you go. Insights into the mind of Brian Goulet. Um, Steve K on Facebook asked, uh, Brian, which rollerball do you personally prefer, the Lamy or the Metropolitan and why? To make it more challenging, don't include price in the decision. Okay, so some context. 
Here's the Lamy Rollerball Safari, and I have a Pilot Metropolitan Rollerball. So I'm a big fan of both models of pen in both the Fountain and the Rollerball version. Um, recent carrier of said pens here at Goulet Pens, I have been literally using both of them. So let's talk about some pros and cons. Okay, Metropolitan Metal Safari Plastic. Which is better? I don't know. They also make an all-star rollerball, so that if you like the metal thing, you could kind of throw that in the mix too. You did just say Lamy, you didn't say Safari specifically. And if price is not an option, you could go with the all-star too. So you got, I guess technically you got more options with Lamy. You could go plastic or you could go aluminum, okay? You got more color options with Lamy. That's a plus. The Lamy has a triangular grip. That could be a plus or a minus. Some people like that, some people don't. If you like to grip really close to the edge of your pen, it's going to be weirder with the Lamy, whereas with the roller, the, the Metropolitan, you can grip that a lot closer. I don't know. Maybe that matters to you. As far as the refill goes, okay, so Lamy's refill is a little bit broader, a little bit wetter. I feel like it's a little bit smoother, perhaps, maybe. It depends. Um, you know, I don't feel that it lasts as long, though. So that's, a, that's another thing. Um, it is a little more expensive than the G2 refill. G2 refill that is used in the Metropolitan, a lot more size options, tip size options. You get a 0 0.38, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 1.0. Lamy, just one option. Um, Lamy has four color options. Metropolitan has a ton. I don't remember exactly how many, but you got the metallic ones, you got pinks and purples and reds and all kinds of stuff. So you got lots of options with these. So honestly, it comes a lot down to preference. For me, I would probably have to say the Metropolitan would win out. I know, I know those of you who are big Lamy fans, you know, may not feel that way. Probably for, I, I think it's for two reasons, two main reasons that are fairly specific to my tastes. One would be the, the, the variety of tip and nib size options. Um, that, or sorry, tip size and color options of the refills. I like to have options. And that comes in real handy, especially with something like a roller ball, because you can keep like a red refill or you can keep some other kind of thing. The metallic refills are really, really cool too. So you got options there. The other one is just the overall general shape. I just, I, I kind of, for what I use it for, um, is a little handier. You know, I carry around my um, traveler's notebook, for example, and I have, I actually literally have um, my clip that I use here, my, my Midori pen clip that I use for this notebook here. The Lamy can fit in there, but it's got a kind of a blunt end and you gotta work it in there. It's kind of a straight tube. It, it can fit, but it's a little longer and it's just not as graceful and you know it can kind of snug in there. Um, the Metropolitan, because it's much more tapered and stuff like that, when you're trying to fit it into um, a sleeve of some kind or a, um, you know, a backpack or a pen slip or something like that, because of the kind of cigar shape to it, it kind of just slides in and out a little more naturally. Those really are kind of about it. The Lamy clip catches on a little better. The clip is a little bigger, but lots of pros and cons, but those are just kind of some things that run through my head. So I think it's really close, but the Metropolitan probably wins out for me. And then there's the price too. It is cheaper. I have to factor that in there. I'm a very utilitarian guy. All right, let's see here. Got one business question for this week from Fernanda B on Facebook. It seems to me that there's only a few countries with fountain pen making tradition, like Germany, Japan, Italy, USA, not as much anymore, Taiwan, and just a few other from Europe or Asia. But I would love to know if that has changed or if there, or if there are good fountain pen brands, maybe new ones or older ones, uh, in other countries, like, I don't know, Portugal, Mexico, Australia, or maybe Ireland. Um, do you know any cool brands from countries that are not normally known for their fountain pen making? If so, do you plan on carrying any of them? Um, well, India would be one. I don't carry any, well, okay, Noodler's pen bodies, uh, most of them, I believe, if not all of them, are made in India. Um, the nibs and other parts are sourced out elsewhere, and I don't know where it's all assembled and stuff like that, but I know like the, the bodies themselves are in India. Um, so India, and I know there's other brands that kind of come out of India. China is another big one. China, I think, actually makes a lot of parts and pen bodies and stuff like that 
for brands that are many, that are that are headquartered elsewhere in the world. So you know, um, I know brands like Pilot and um, you know Platinum and other ones like that. They manufacture most, if not all, their stuff like in Japan. Um, but I know that there's other brands, you know, like Schaefer and like Cross and stuff like that, that are like headquartered, not in China but they have their manufacturing, at least some of their pens, or if they're not a blend or parts or whatever in China. China manufactures a lot of pens. Um, so um, that's, uh, that is definitely something that should be, I mean, you, met, you, you kind of threw like Asia and kind of lumped it in there. And also like France has some fountain pens and stuff like that. Um, but if you're asking specifically like, you know, Australia or like, you know, Africa, South America, I literally can't name you a single brand that comes out of those. And I feel kind of bad about that, but I just, I don't know. Like, I don't know anything that comes out of there. I'd be very curious if you know of any, please leave them in the comments. I just, I, I can't even name you an older one or a, or a current one that's made kind of in any of those areas. So I may be wrong. I mean, it may be possible that there aren't, but um, they're certainly not like distributed currently, at least in the US. If so, I would probably have heard about it, but um, you know, I really just don't know. I'm sorry. So um, I'd be very curious to know if anybody else has any, but India is probably the biggest one uh, that you didn't specifically mention here. All right, and then the last question I have for this week, kept keeping it a little bit briefer this, this week, um, I got a troubleshooting question from uh, Daniel B on Facebook. When I ink up my Pelican M400 white tortoise version, special edition, with Noodler's Hunter, this section gets stained a little in green and the nib gets very difficult to remove the green coating which causes a green tint. Is there any way to eliminate this? I like to use only permanent inks, but is that the problem? Um, yes, it's kind of a twofold thing. So you got a white pen. White pens are more prone to staining in general, just, just as a general rule, just be ready for that. Um, this pen in particular, you know, you're, it's got the white grip and everything. You've got Noodler's Hunter, which is a permanent green. Not only that, but it's in the Noodler's Eternal line, which tends to be a little clingier than most of the other Noodler's inks, even most of the other like Noodler's permanent inks, those Eternal inks. So like the Eternal ones, the one ounce bottles, like Hunter, Fox, Whiteness of the Whale. Uh, that one's not as much because it's kind of, you know, not as, not as much of an actual ink, more of a dilution thing. Um, and then Periwinkle in Luxury Blue. I think that's all of them. Those ones really tend to cling to whatever pen that you're using. Um, and then also, kind of in the same line there, you've got um, the Russian and the UK inks. So like Socrates, um, let's see here, Rachmaninoff, L. Lawrence, Empire Red, all of those, Tchaikovsky, um, all of those inks tend to be a little clingy as well. Um, and then Kung to Chang, Whaleman Sepia, some of these like fringe Noodler's inks that are you know, where are, are like exclusives and stuff like that. Those tend to be a little clingier. So they take a little more work to clean out. So you kind of have to be ready for that. And then maybe consider that when you're making your pen choice. So maybe Hunter, you leave with a pen that doesn't have a white grip section or that, you know, you don't notice the, the, the tendency to cling a little bit more. I'm not gonna say stain, cause I don't know if it's necessarily like a permanent thing that you have to worry about, but it's certainly kind of a pain to clean off, right? So um, if you're gonna be swapping that color in and out a lot, on that particular pen, you know, that's not a cheap pen either. So maybe just like, don't use that particular ink in that pen. Um, I went and pulled up some, um, I'm gonna leave a link for you on the blog. I can't leave a link directly in YouTube. Well, I guess I can leave a link in YouTube. Well, maybe, we'll see, we'll see. I can't do a hyperlink directly in the YouTube description, but um, anyway, look on the blog. You can do search filters on gouletpens.com. If you, if you go and you click on bottled ink and then you click green and then you click water resistant. It'll show you a search filter of all the water resistant, you know, greens that we have. Um, some ones that I think might be uh, ones you could consider. Noodler's General of the Armies. It's a little more of a blue green than Hunter, but um, Green Marine might be one. It's a little darker than Hunter. There's nothing that's going to be exactly like Hunter and still be permanent. So it's just something that you can, that you can play around with there and, and give some options. But um, I think that it's a kind of a combination of the two, but mainly the ink. So there you go, that's it for this week. Wow, a little bit shorter here, 44 minutes so far. So that's pretty good. Um, I got a question of the week for you this week. A good one, okay, this is a good one. All you lurkers out there, how long did you lurk on this channel, whether it's the blog or on YouTube, how long did you lurk before posting something? 
whether it's a response or a question, whatever. Or are you still lurking right now? And if so, I would like for you to end your lurking streak and then tell me how long it's taken you until now to actually engage with me on these channels. I'm very curious to know, because literally I'm not joking with you. I get emails and, and sometimes you know hear comments and stuff like that from people that say, I've been watching your videos for a year and a half and I've never bought anything, I've never responded, never I've been lurking for like a year and a half, I've watched every video you've made, I'm so excited to place my first order with you. That happens, and it's, it's amazing, and I'm flattered by that, but I fully realize that there are quite a few of you who are out there that are not engaging, and that's okay, you know, I encourage you to engage though, because that's really exciting for me, for my whole team, we get to see a lot of activity, we'll respond, and then other people get to see your comments and stuff, it's really cool, like we're all here to kind of build, share a community and stuff like that. So I really encourage you, if you haven't already, stop lurking, end your streak, get involved, it's okay, it's not scary, it's not intimidating, especially if you're on like YouTube or whatever, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy, if you have a Google account already, YouTube, it's easy to throw that in there respond. The blog is a little more complicated. You got to set up a discuss account and be able to post and stuff like that. It's, it's not quite as straightforward, so I understand there's not as many comments on the blog, and that's okay. But YouTube especially, go ahead. Go ahead. Just, just jump on. Jump on. Why not? And then you can subscribe while you're at it, right? Um, got almost 25,000 subscribers now. That's pretty cool. So another shout out to Periscope. Lots of behind the stuff, lots of behind the scenes stuff on Periscope. So if you are interested in seeing kind of like more kind of throughout the day, little blips and blabs and Blips and blabs. Yep, I just said that. So if you got little dribs and drabs and blibs and blabs as we're doing things here uh, at Goulet, you can see what we're doing a little bit behind the scenes. So Periscope is pretty cool for that. Um, so jump on that app. It's a hot, hot up and coming app. It's going to change a lot of things. It's linked up through Twitter so you get a notification whenever we're live. It's pretty cool. Um, anyway, hope you had an enjoyable broadcast here. Hope you've had a good June so far. We're just getting into June, which is blowing my mind. My son's graduating. Um, you know, oh, you know what? I wanted to shout out. I'm going to do a little late shout out here. Calligraphy Pete, the one who asked question number nine here. Calligraphy Pete mentioned in another question that I did not answer, um, said that he's got a brand new baby, a week old. So Calligraphy Pete, congratulations. You're probably going to be up watching this video at like 4.30 in the morning as you're trying to console your screaming baby. Um, been there, done that. My sister actually just had a baby a little over a week ago. So I am feeling your pain, brother. Been there twice, got two kids of my own. My sister's got her second child now. So right there, Rachel's sister is about to, about to give birth to her first child here in the next couple of weeks. So lots of baby action going on around here. You know, Adam on our fulfillment team, he's our fulfillment manager, um, had a baby about six weeks ago. So he's in the thick of it as well. His baby's a dream baby though, just sleeping like crazy. It's pretty awesome. So fun, fun baby time. So shout out to Pete there. Anyway, since I ended the broadcast a little early, I'm just kind of like going on and on now. Longest question of the week uh, that I've probably ever had. So that said, I'm gonna go ahead and end it. Um, if you like any of these products, you can check them out. We got links to all the products that I've mentioned specifically on the blog, so you can go check those out. Gulaypens.com slash blog, no wait, blog.gulaypens.com, that's what it is. Um, and then you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, please do that. Um, you can, um, you know, link up the blog and your RSS feed and so on. You know, follow us on Twitter, uh, at Goulet Pens. You can follow me on Twitter, Brian Goulet underscore. Um, there, Periscope at Goulet Pens. Instagram at Goulet Pens. Lots of fun ways. Facebook, the Goulet Pen Company. Lots of cool ways to interact with us. We're having a good time on lots of these platforms these days. So, hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I will see you next week for Q&A again. Be sure to ask lots of questions on any of these channels and we're happy to take them. Thanks so much for watching. And as always, undoubtedly, unindubitably right on. <laughs> Indubitably, what does that even mean? I don't know specifically, but there we go. <laughs>